Food & Wine Insider is a weekly look at a $1.5 trillion industry touching every American. Devoted to the business of purveying food and decanting wines, Food & Wine Radio is a unique program highlighting not food recipes or wine vintages, but how to make a profit while satisfying America's palates. In this competitive but highly rewarding sector, many men and women have made profits while fulfilling a dream. Food & Wine Insider is all about better managing any business involving food & wine. Each week, your co-hosts sit down with successful restaurateurs, food mavens, winery vendors, store owners, food suppliers, and other leaders in the worldwide industry that centers on foodstuff and wine. In frank give-and-take sessions, guests and panelists talk about the business of bringing healthy and pleasurable foods and wines to others. Your Food & Wine radio host, are Ann Daw, former president of the Specialty Food Association, and a longtime food executive who has held senior positions both here and abroad with Kraft Foods and Philip Morris. Don Mazella, a nationally known business commentator. On each show, they invite leaders of the world's culinary and wine industries to share the secrets of their success. Visit us at foodandwineinsider.com. This is Ann Daw, host of Food and Wine Insider, and I'm here today with Ann Prado. She's VP of the Joe T. and Chips Company. Welcome to Food and Wine Insider, Ann. Hi, Ann. Thank you for having me. It's rather nice to talk to another Ann who doesn't use an E, but anyway, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to start first by telling your story, the story before Joe T. was born. Well, it was a long time ago. You know, we've actually been doing this for 22 years, and I'm a CPA by trade. I graduated from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and my husband was in finance, and we got involved in a clothing business, um, which we had run for 10 years, and the business was successful. We sold to department stores all over the country, from, you know, Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom's, you know, down to Kmart. And we learned about consumer products, impulse items, and branding. Even though we had a financial background, we learned the marketing side. And we were doing that at a time when um, all the department stores in the late 80s, early 90s went bankrupt due to um, junk bonds and strange real estate deals. And we found this business that we killed ourselves for 10 years to build in a very precarious position. So we wanted to start a new business that didn't have the same problems of the clothing business. So our first problem was is that in the clothing business, we were unable to build a brand. We had a collection of items, and we realized the value in a business is your brand. So number two, the other thing that we wanted to do is we didn't want to repeat the mistakes that the clothing business had, which was all your sales were concentrated to these large retailers and you were kind of beholden to them. We wanted somewhere where you could sell it to lots and lots of places. And then lastly, and probably the most important thing, is if they bought it and they liked it, they wanted more. So that's how we came up in the food business. We knew how to manufacture. We knew how to market. We did know how to deal with big retailers. Um, and the uh, supermarkets are pussycats compared to the department stores. So um, that's what we did. And we started looking into different um, areas of the food business. And we came up with the concept of the old-fashioned lemonade stand. And we started, we made uh, 72,000 bottles of uh, pink lemonade. And my husband started selling them out of the trunk of the car going door to door. And we soon found out that we had the wrong product that at the time, lemonade wasn't the thing, that tea was the thing. So we reinvented ourselves and started Joe Tea, and we went from there. Well, that's pr very remarkable. And, you know, in the food business, there are low entries, or low barriers to entry, uh, but it doesn't, it, it's not uncomplex in terms of the things that you can and can't do. And, uh, you know, selling into retailers and distributors is certainly not an easy thing to do. You know, there's lots of teas and flavored teas on the market and obviously some very mighty players in the category. What's your unique selling proposition? Well, you know, a lot of people, especially when they're saying, when we started, they're saying, how are you possibly going to compete 
against Coke. And the thing is, is yes, we're competing against Coke's beverages and products, but we're not competing against when we're, we built our business around gourmet stores, specialty stores, farm stands, farm markets, a whole grassroots kind of following. So when we're in a store and we're in a cooler, I wouldn't say, you know, Coke is a billion dollar company and we are not. The sales on an individual store are not that tilted. So we compete very well head on head. The other thing is, is that we do have relationships with the store owners. We're not the nameless, faceless company. We're, you know, the Ann and Steve. Um, Steve is my husband. Um, company and the store owners, who are business people themselves, have the opportunity, if they need to, talk to the founder of the company. And there's relationships there that are different than with the Coca-Cola. But I guess the big thing is, is that we have a truck on our on our label, which kind of indicates kind of a rugged independence or our motto was the original off-road tea. People like to try something different, to not just go with the same and to take a chance. And I think that is where our products go. And of course we taste great, but everybody tastes great. So that, I mean, taste isn't enough. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your unique label, the name of your brand. As you said earlier, brand is really important because at the end of the day, you don't want people just saying, well, I want a tea. You want them to say, I want Joe tea. So tell, tell us a little bit about or help people visualize what's on your label, what it symbolizes, and what it sort of means to the consumer when they see that label. Well, the name Joe, um, first of all, I try, tried to go to have it be Auntie, but uh, that didn't work. <laughs> and you should have been rooting for me, Anne, being the Anne without an E that you are. But um, my husband's middle name is Joe, and his father's name is Joe. And we came from a graphic design background. That's what we made in the clothing business. We made T-shirts. So Joe and T was something that was big. It was bold. It laid out on a label. So our label is a big Joe, a big T, and a picture of a 1947 Dodge Power Wagon on the label, which is kind of an old-fashioned pickup truck. And the, the labels themselves are very colorful. So we had learned in the T-shirt business that they have to be able to see the label across the room. Um, so that's where the big Joe and T comes in. And colors attract people. And you need to have somebody, I always say you have to have somebody reach out and grab the product. Then they get a chance to taste it. But if they don't grab it, they're never going to get that far. So that's why we were very um, – we realized the importance of branding. And when we first started, I, we would sit on our little computer at home. And remember, this is 1996, so things were not quite as sophisticated as they are now. Um, and we would make paper labels, and then we would sneak into the supermarket and stick them on the shelves and see how it stood out against our competitors. <laughs> so that's how we did our designing. Well, this is Ann Daw, and I'm here with Ann Prado of Joe T. and Chips Company. And, you know, you talk about dealing with retailers, and I'm sure there have been times where they've been challenging and pushing back in terms of what you want to sell in terms of your product. How did you overcome some of that? Because that's a really interesting part of learning that we want to impart with the audience. Well, we actually started this business with $1,000. Um, so we didn't have money. And I think having money, you know, is a blessing and a curse. You can't grow as fast if you don't have money, but you also think harder before you make mistakes, and you're going to make a lot of mistakes. We couldn't make enough product because we didn't have money, and we also didn't have the infrastructure for production. So we had no incentive to discount our product to sell it. We could sell everything that we made at full price, and that was a mantra that we stuck to. So we didn't feel we're a private company, so we didn't have investors. So we didn't feel the pressure that some of these companies have when they have investors and they have to show rapid sales growth. The other thing is that we, in the clothing business, we could throw stuff in a UPS box, ship it out, and be done with it. We found out with glass bottled beverages, it doesn't work that way. The only way to do it is to deliver it by truck. And we, in our naivete, thought, oh, well, we'll just have a distributor do it until we found out very rapidly nobody was interested. So we did it ourselves. 
And that turned out to be a very important move in that um, we have trucks. Uh, we do our own distribution in the New York metro area, and nobody can tell us what we can and cannot do. And um, it also allows us to sell directly to stores without that middleman. Now, in other markets, we do have distributor partners, but that came later. That came after we got a mm -hmm. foothold ourselves in the New York metro area, which, again, it's New York. <laughs> Yes, it is New York, and it's a tough market to, to work in, certainly. I would love for you to uh, tell us about your first break in terms of acceptance. Tell us that story. Well, um, now that I've touted our distribution in New York, <laughs> it didn't happen in New York. So, again, we started knocking on doors in New York, and it's we, my husband. I'm not the salesperson he is. Um, he started knocking on doors in, in, the New, York, in New Jersey, and they really could care less because every new brand comes and wants to make their debut in New York, and they're constantly seeing new things every single day. And it's hard for the store owners to be able to, you know, consistently pick who's going to be the winner. They try a lot of different things and then see what their customers say. So we had read up in – there used to be a brand called Mad River, which started around the same time as we did, and they were based out of Vermont. And they had these beautiful glass-molded bottles – and Coca-Cola um, acquired Mad River. So um, my husband said, well, why don't I go up to Vermont and see what's going on? We had heard they acquired them. They were going to redo their packaging to be less expensive, and they pulled them out of the market for a couple of months. So when we went up to Vermont and started visiting these general stores, there was a hole. So here we are. We showed up with Joe T. We have our truck on the label. We, we were the perfect kind of fit. And we ended up selling to all these general stores. And in these small towns in Vermont, that's it. There's one store in a town. So we became kind of the monopoly in those towns. And then when Coke came back, their spot was gone. And Joe T. was selling fine, and everybody was happy. So then what started happening is people from this area – would start going on vacation in Vermont and see us. So we came, we're a New Jersey brand who came in by way of Vermont, and we started in western New Jersey and the more less, less dense packs and then moved in to, you know, the city. Um, and we would just salt our way around in farm stands and farm markets. And it's amazing the types of inquiries we get from those places. We've had people in Kuwait call us because they saw us in a farm market in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, we've had people from Japan call us because they've found us in a farm market, you know, in Virginia. So it's, it's, it's an interesting place to start because it's an experience for people. And then Joe T becomes part of that experience. You know, and I love that story because it's all about being where the competition isn't. And, exactly. You know, <laughs> luck is a good thing, you know. Uh, you know, you talk about also selling in many countries outside the U.S. And you've utilized the Food Export Market Access Program, and they fund a branded program, um, I think, since two, 2012 to help grow and expand exports. Uh, talk a little bit about how that program works and how it's helped you sell your products overseas. You sell in a lot of countries overseas. Yes, we do. We actually sell to about 20 countries overseas. Um, we use the food export program, and um, we also utilize uh, the Specialty Food Association, which you were the past president of. Um, the Specialty Food Association, are your viewers familiar with that? Um, they, they may or may not show. be. Go right ahead. <laughs> Uh, they run trade shows for um, specialty food, and they take contingents to large trade shows overseas. So we all go kind of as a group, and they subsidize the cost, which makes it a little bit um, more reasonable because it can be very expensive to do that. And then the food export program is run in a public-private partnership with uh, the federal government where they provide funds to support sports, so they will help – uh, defray some of the costs involved. But the most important thing that we get out of the food export program is advice, where they have experts on different markets in different countries where they can help guide you. You know, this country is going to be more or less receptive to your products because of X, Y, and Z. Um, it gets complicated because there's different rules and ingredients. But 
the most the the initial step in exporting came when um, tourists from other countries came who were in the food business and then saw us in the stores. Um, we Whole Foods has been a great partner of ours, and they're very visible in New York City, so they would see us in Whole Foods, and then they would contact us. And the initial exporting, we really had to find the proper partners where they had the expertise to do it because we were not prepared. And it really isn't something that a company should do until they're ready because um, the paperwork can be pretty overwhelming. But once you get the hang of it, um, it's really not so different than selling in the United States. We have this very large country that has markets that are far away. It's actually cheaper to ship to Europe than it is to ship to California. And we have states that have different rules and regulations. So we're dealing with some of that in the U.S., but it's to a higher level in, in foreign countries. Well, again, this is Ann Daw with Food and Wine Insider, and we've been talking with Ann Prado from the Joe T. and Chips Company. You know, we didn't talk about this earlier, but I, I think people would be curious to know how you're priced versus other bottled teas on the market. We consider ourselves a premium product, um, so we are more expensive. Um, we're, you know, Snapple in Arizona, their prices have – Arizona has positioned themselves as a lower price brand, and Snapple has had pressure, you know, downward pressure. Snapple has also changed their packaging to plastic, and we've remained in glass, so we have a lot of customers like that. Um, we have always tried to be the premium brand. Um, part of that comes from our business experience is you need to make money to stay in business, and because we had no outside investors, we needed our profits to reinvest. And positioning yourself as a premium brand tends to insulate you a little bit from, um, from you know, the ups and downs uh, in the economy. Um, people tend to be a little less price sensitive in that market. And then the other thing, I remember I read a quote from the founder of Red Bull. If you don't make your product more expensive, how do people know that it's better? So those combinations and glass is expensive. <laughs> you know, Anne, I think when you have limited marketing dollars, price actually says something about your product and its value. So price can play a very important role in terms of the brand image, the brand perception, the product perception. So I, I give you kudos for, for doing that. You also have chips because it's Joe T and Chips Company. When did yes, you start <laughs> making? When did you start making chips and in several flavors, I might add, and why? Um, what happened with the chips is there was another chip company who shall remain nameless who wanted to buy us. Um, they had a thriving chip business, and they said, you know, hey, selling beverages with chips would be a good idea because everywhere that we sell, chips sell. Um, a lot of, again, a lot of our market is in the corner deli. So when you buy your sandwich, you buy a drink, you buy a bag of potato chips. And we said, hey, that is a great idea. <laughs> and we already knew how to do manufacturing. And so we went, set out, and started chips, and it was an instant hit. And the best part about it is because we do our distribution, our own distribution, and people who – aren't involved with trucking, don't think about this, but it's really efficient because the tea is heavy, it goes on the bottom, and the chips are light, and they go on top. So uh, our trucks generally were filled with a lot of air because you can only, there's a weight limit to how much you can put in a truck. So here we were able to fill out our trucks, and it's been a terrific addition to our business. And the other thing that is so nice about chips is they are really light. We just never appreciated light things until you started dealing with heavy glass bottles. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, filling the trucks and also the weight thing is it's unbelievably important. You talked a little bit earlier about how little it was that you used to fund the business, but having been in business over 20 years now, uh, how, how are you continuing to fund the business? Is it self-funding? Is I know most people tell me it, it's a, that's quite amazing. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about that, how that works, because you've, you've done something that is not typical. Well, it wasn't easy. Um, you know, 
uh, we we say we dug ourselves a very huge hole for about five years and then spent the next five years kind of clawing out of it. Now, when we say we started with $1,000, we did max out our credit cards and we did all those things and we used to have sleepless nights over that. But the biggest thing, um, again, coming from a financial background is just financial discipline. Um, you need to take your profits and roll it back in. And we tried to save money wherever we could. I worked at home for many, many years. We used to keep our – we now have a nice warehouse, but back then we had an unheated warehouse, which was, you know, miserable <laughs> in the winter. Um, we would – we found manufacturers that would make small minimums for us. That was a huge thing. We had to rely on the um, goodness of our suppliers. I mean, people gave us credit who shouldn't have given us credit. Um, when we were paying slowly, they stuck with us. We were always very um, – we always kept our word with people, and if we were having issues paying – this is way back when – you know, we would communicate that. And then the people who stuck with us, we have stuck with. We have loyalty to our suppliers because they were so good to us when we were getting started. But the big thing, I think the hardest part is, I, I just read this term. It's like, um, I don't know what the, it's, it's like success porn. You know, they have um, so many stories about these companies that are funded with outside investors and you feel a lot of pressure like why aren't you growing to be the unicorn and we've learned over time it's much better to have a cash flow positive business that can sustain you and grow with steady foundations than do the meteoric rise i think the other thing about it is with these larger stores you only get one shot so you better be ready and if you aren't ready, um, that's going to cause a lot of problems, too. Growing fast is much harder than not having enough money because um, you're scrambling to get production. You're doing things that you're not used to doing, and you're dealing with much bigger dollars. Um, I think also another thing is a lot of people who go into um, the food business don't, have, don't, don't know accounting, don't know how to collect their bills. And, you know, one of the first things I always ask people who want to be entrepreneurs is, have you taken an accounting class? And if you haven't, go online and take one or find a partner who knows how to do it. So I think that that's just knowing your numbers. Is, I think uh, that's really important. helpful advice, especially for budding entrepreneurs. And you just let me let led me right into that question. But I wanted to ask you, what do you feel you're still learning about this business? Well, this business is changing really fast. I think, you know, one thing we've learned is things don't change, tr stay the same. And there's a lot of trends in the food business. We, we, because we came from the clothing business, we actually, in a derogatory way, call it junior sportswear. Because junior sportswear, the you know, juniors are teenage girls, or teenagers, I suppose, um, where the fashion changes on a whim you know, um, you know, the, whatever the trends it used to like a couple of years ago, it was no carbs and everybody's doing everything, you know, no carb. And then, you know, the next thing comes up and it, you know, it changes. So we tend to hold back when we're waiting on, um, the trends. And, um, but the one thing that is happening is the rise of Amazon and e-commerce is changing the distribution landscape. And because we are a business so heavily dependent on distribution, that is what I weigh, uh, lay awake at night thinking about and worrying about. How are we going to adapt to that? Do we need to change our packaging? Are we going to exist as a distribution company? Amazon is our partner in that we sell to Whole Foods. So um, how do we embrace that? <laughs> Um, no, that's, that's really helpful. I think that that's a big right, and also on the on demand nature of things. It used to be if somebody didn't let's say somebody tried your product and it wasn't to their liking, not that there was anything wrong with it, but that the um lemon tea was too lemony. They in the old days they just wouldn't buy it anymore. Now they send you an email or they send you a tweet or they send you they post a message on Facebook. And that's been hard for us to adjust to, 
to understand um, the difference in what the customer is demanding as opposed to it's a transaction, they have it, if they like it, they buy more, and if they don't like it, then they buy something else next time. I think the communication issue of it. And you've been really unbelievably helpful, and your advice has been really spot on. Can you tell us your website for where people can find Joe Tea and, t- tea and Chips? Our website is www.joetea.com. And we can be found in the New York Metro Market in Whole Foods and King's, Balducci's, Fresh Market, and uh, some shop rights. And, of course, all your little farm stands, gourmet stores, <laughs> general stores, and corner stores. Well, Ann Prado, it's been a real joy having you on the show. This interview will be on foodandwineinsider.com tonight. And you can listen to this and all previous shows and those that are upcoming there's also a survey you can fill out, fill out to give us some advice on what guests you would like to hear. And Prado, thank you again. I wish you all the best, you and Stephen, uh, for our continued success with the, with the business. I mean, 22 years is a long time. I hope for much success in the next 22. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having um, us, Anne. And um, drink Joe tea and eat Joe chips. <laughs> <laughs> To be successful, most restaurant owners require extra capital from time to time. When you need funding to renovate, buy equipment, or manage cash flow, you don't have time to track down financial statements or wait weeks for a decision. That's where Cabbage can help. Cabbage gives small businesses access to a line of credit of up to $200,000. Apply online and you'll get a decision right away. Since Cabbage is a line of credit, you can take the exact amount you need. You never have to reapply to take additional loans, and you'll only pay for the funds you use. Cabbage has helped more than 230,000 businesses from every industry. And with $4 billion in funding, Cabbage is A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau and was named the Forbes Top 100 Companies twice in a row. Check out Cabbage at cabbagewithak.com slash food and wine, and you'll get a $50 gift card when you qualify. That's K-A-B-B-A-G-E dot com slash food and wine. Line of credit is subject to credit approval. See terms and conditions. All Cabbage business loans are issued by Celtic Bank, a Utah chartered industrial bank, member FDIC. You are listening to Ann Daw, and the program is Food and Wine Insider. If you have a question or know someone you think our listeners should hear, contact us. You can listen to past shows at foodandwineinsider.com. Hi, I'm Ann Daw, your host of Food and Wine Insider, and I'm here today with Scott Jones. He's the VP of Content for E-Meals. Welcome to Food and Wine Insider, Scott. Hey, Ann. How are you today? Awesome. Awesome. Let's start by talking a bit about your background. You've not only been mm-hmm. an executive editor of Southern Living Magazine, but have owned a business called Jones is Hungry and Jones is Thirsty, clearly making you an expert in food and wine. Uh, tell our audience <laughs> about your experiences and what led you to emails. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, it sounds lofty. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm definitely a food and wine enthusiast. Um, I guess the, the, the quick overview is that um, um, you're right. I was the executive editor for Southern Living Magazine. Um, I was there for about 11 years, um, but I'm also a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America uh, up in Hyde Park and uh, um, also worked at Food and Wine Magazine. So I've had a lot of experience both um, in the food as, as it relates to being in the kitchen, and then, but mostly on the media side. Um, and, you know, when this opportunity with emails came up, I guess, you know, um, it was really just so easy to see the value of what emails was doing and where the company was going. Uh, and the fact that it was really helping to solve a fundamental problem, which is, you know, what's for dinner. You know, you head up content for emails. What, what does that mean? What does that involve? Yeah, I, um, I work with a, a very talented group of food professionals, ranging from 
recipe developers to registered dietitians to food stylists to photographers, you know, all of whom help create our 15 different food style meal plans with over 100 new recipes that go out each week. Excellent. And, and what is email, uh, e-meals, excuse me, and how is it different from other <laughs> meal kit businesses like Blue Apron? I know there's a big story here because it is quite yeah. different, but I want you to tell that story to our listeners. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great question. Well, you know, e-meals is America's leading uh, meal planning service and meal kit alternative. Uh, meal planning services and meal kits have really worked to meet the hurdles that um, consumers face in getting dinner on the table, uh, whether it's helping them with recipe information or inspiration to, you know, saving them time shopping for groceries. Um, and emails provides the same kind of convenience as traditional meal kit providers, uh, but by integrating with existing grocery delivery partners like Walmart Pickup, um, Kroger Clicklist, Instacart, Amazon Fresh, we're able to help our customers get dinner on the table at half the food cost per serving. Um, I guess in other words, I would say e-meals is an affordable, less wasteful alternative to traditional meal kits. Um, we deliver uh, the same meal planning and recipe inspiration advantages uh, by leveraging the existing grocery supply chain to eliminate the cost of pre-portioning, you know, the bagging, the boxing, uh, delivering those ingredients. So our strategy um, cuts the food price per meal in half compared to meal kits. Okay. And who would you say is the target audience for emails? How would you describe those consumers yeah. most interested in your service? Right, right. Well, I think our, our target customer is, frankly, anyone who thinks about, you know, what's for dinner tonight. Um, you know, which we can all relate to, right? Um, but I think, um, you know, most, uh, I guess I would describe the, the target um, audience as, you know, anyone um, that um, has a busy family. Um, we know that um, the, most of our subscribers are um, parents who are working, both working. Um, they dread hearing, you know, what's for dinner? You know, and they hear it every afternoon around five o'clock. So our, um, our, our customer may be a new cook. Uh, it may, may be a cook who has a lot of confidence in the kitchen. But what's common among all of them is that they have decision fatigue and they're wanting to break out of that dinnertime rut. You know, they want simple recipe ideas that allow them to feed their family, you know, really delicious, nutritious meals. So talk a bit about how the consumer engages with emails. What's the process? What do they do? Yeah. Well, um, seven meal ideas are curated each week by our food experts, that team of really uh, amazing food folks that we have. And they're sent through our free um, smartphone app. So we have an app for iOS and Android. Um, and the recipes really offer variety and flexibility allowing the customers to pick the ones that best fit their needs for that week. And then once those meals are chosen for the week, um, the app automatically populates uh, a shopping list with all of those ingredients. Uh, and then, but subscribers can also, they can delete any unwanted ingredients or unneeded ingredients. They can add additional items like cereal or laundry detergent to their shopping list. And um, that feature actually you know, it, it eliminates those extra shopping trips um, that really aren't um, available uh, with traditional meal kits. You know, with a meal kit, you just get what you need for those meals, but you're, you're still shopping for other items that you might need for that week. Our shopping list allows customers to add those additional shopping items. And you mentioned that it's a subscription. So how, what does an email uh, subscription cost? Well, uh, the subscription is as low as um, $5 a month for a one-year subscription. Um, we also have a, um, a, six, a three- and six-month option, but the vast majority of our subscribers um, come to us for a, a one-year subscription. Okay. I mean, that's pretty inexpensive for helping people sort of have an idea, or, and you say get out of the rut of what's for dinner. That's right. 
You know, yeah. I'm I'm thinking about you know the aging population here, and maybe folks of a certain generation are not so versed with ordering online or using the internet. Is there a way for them yeah. to use the email service? Oh, you bet, you bet, and that's a great question, uh, and I'm glad you asked that. Um, you know, that's not a problem at all. Um, you know, our subscribers can use the shopping list in the mobile app to self shop. Um, and that shopping list is categorized by section, just like the way a person would normally shop in the grocery store. Uh, and what's more, what I really want to point out, in addition, whether you're self-shopping or having it you know, picked up or gathered at the grocery store or delivered, one of the really key um, features of the shopping list is that all of those ingredients are combined into a purchasable amount. So, for example, if a half a cup of shredded cheese is used in – say three different recipes that week, the shopping list tells the customer that they need to buy one eight ounce package of shredded cheese rather than telling them they just need one and one half cups of shredded cheese, you know, leaving them to kind of figure out what package size they need to, to buy. You know, we do all that thinking for them. This is Ann Daw, and I'm your host for Food and Wine Insider. I'm here today with Scott Jones. He's the VP of content for emails. Scott, Explain to our listeners the return on investment of emails versus other less successful meal kit businesses and why you're able to achieve such a positive profitability. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I, I'd say that, you know, our business model really lends itself to profitable unit economics. Um, and in large part, that's because we rely on the existing grocery channel for fulfillment. Um, which is the exact opposite of what traditional milk companies do. Um, grocers and food brands also benefit uh, because our subscribers do their shopping either physically in the store or online through our grocery partner integration instead of receiving those prepackaged ingredients um, that require um, getting, you know, that meal kits have to get those from wholesalers. So part of, part of your plan is not being involved in the fact that you're doing the shopping for people and putting the kit and obviously shipping it and packaging and so on. You're really fundamentally about here's the idea, here's the list, use the, use the distribution system that's in place, that's and right. you, you have a sort of simple formula for making sure you get what you need, you're efficient in terms of your shopping, and you have variety in your in your meal occasions. Is that kind of that is exactly it? that is exactly correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Anne, um, we'd love for you to um, maybe join our um, PR and marketing team. Uh, <laughs> no, because that's exactly that's exactly right. I mean, we really are. Um, again, whether someone's self shopping or they're doing, um, you know, they're um, doing pickup or delivery, we are leveraging the existing grocery supply chain. How many? Tell us a little bit about how many different types of email plans there are, mm -hmm. and I would love for you to describe one or two of them just to bring it alive. Sure, sure, sure. So we offer 15 different meal plan food styles, ranging from quick and healthy to low carb to diabetic. Uh, for example, our quick and healthy meal plan features recipes with eight ingredients or less, using really simple cooking techniques. Um, to create meals that are ready in 30 minutes or less. Um, we have a diabetic meal plan that offers um, low glycemic recipes using lean meats and seasonal vegetables. Uh, and those meals have less than 500 calories uh, per serving, as well as 30 to 55 carbs per serving. So it's, it's really tailored to someone who's either pre-diabetic or diabetic. So we have a wide range of food styles that meet really meet uh, every customer where they are in terms of their lifestyle um, or, um, you know, kind of health goals. And which one do you ascribe to? I'm a big fan of our quick and healthy. Um, I'm, a, you know, I have um, two teenage daughters and my wife and I are both working. And I love the fact that, you know, we have easy access to these recipes that are quick and easy and healthy and, um, you know, have a little flair to them, but not, but simple enough to make on a, on a Tuesday night. And what type of 
because you're online, I would think there's pretty simple access to being able to research with the consumer and be able to continue to improve the service or the types of meals that people need. Talk a little bit about the research that you do. Well, I mean, we, we like most uh, good companies, we try and really stay um, in close contact with our customers, are really in tune with their needs and how they're growing and developing. Um, we recently, um, this past summer, uh, just completed a, um, a, a big survey of our, um, of our um, existing subscribers and got almost 5,000 responses um, from that survey um, with very direct um, feedback about how they're using it, how it's improving their lives. For example, um, we know that from this uh, group of almost 5,000 that responded that um, they are cooking um, up to five nights a week in the home now by using email. So that's like one of the benefits of like how has emails um, you know, changed your life. They're cooking at home now. Um, almost five nights a week, up from three nights a week, we know that they're saving time. It's reducing stress. So, you know, we really, um, and we also have, a, 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 have really doubled down on our customer success team, which is um, speaking directly to our subscribers, answering questions, helping get them um, plugged into the right meal plan that, again, fits their lifestyle or fits their health goal. And I think you mentioned earlier that you fairly frequently refresh the ideas that you're providing. Is that every, I, I wasn't sure if it was every week or if it's how, – how do you do that? It's every week. Um, wow. New meal plans go out to subscribers. I know. Uh, I, I'm, sometimes I just sweat thinking about that because our <laughs> team really is working – um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts. You're talking about more than 100 new recipes going out each week across our 15 different food styles. Um, but, yeah, we, we are – That's again, that's part of the, the work that, I, I, in my opinion, only trained food professionals can do is they have the knowledge. They under, both understand um, the food in general, but they can – put themselves in the, in, into the minds, into the kitchens of our subscribers and create those recipes that are going to allow them to have success. This is Food and Wine Insider, and I'm here today with Scott Jones. He's the VP of Content for Emails. Question I wanted to ask, you've been in business for nearly seven years. Uh, have mm-hmm. you found over time – that your subscribers are staying longer in the plan? Is there, how long do people typically stay with the, with the plan? Well, I think we, we would say that um, you know, generally speaking, they're staying with the plan um, for about two years. Um, but, you know, as life changes, they, maybe their household changes, they might pause their subscription, come back to it later. But um, generally we're seeing that our subscribers are, are, um, staying with us for an average of two years. So then there, there must be a need to always bring in new subscribers. How, how do you find the folks who are subscribing to your business? Well, we use, uh, you know, the traditional marketing channels. Um, you know, we're, um, we're obviously a digital based company. So we're, you know, um, you know, leveraging those um, paid channels. Um, we've also um, had uh, been um, working with, um, in radio with one of the you know, big um, names in um, the radio world for many years now. So we use many of the same channels, but, you know, we're fine. I mean, you know, the, the thing is, is that even though we, we know that, you know, the, the um, average um, length of, um, of a subscriber is about two years, we see that increasing more and more as our product becomes more robust. Um, and again, in this survey, we found that we've had people that have been with us, um, you know, four, five, six, seven years. Um, and we see that number getting larger and larger as we begin to roll out these features like integration with our grocery partners and things like that. I would think that in the time that you've evolved, that people are, the word of mouth is probably a pretty powerful component. If someone's really oh, loving yeah. your system that they're recommending it to friends and whatnot. Do you, do you have a way of tracking that or, or at least we, getting we that and, type of information? 
We do, we do, Ann, and, and you're exactly right. And, and I and I should have mentioned that earlier. You know, when, when you ask about our marketing channels, I immediately am thinking paid, um, and how we're you know doing those traditional uh, outreach. But by far and away, our largest source of of customer acquisition is through word of mouth. And we're we're I think we're very fortunate to have such a passionate group of subscribers. Um, when you um, come to emails.com and sign up for your meal plan, um, there's a, a kind of a how did you hear menu that we're able to track uh, where these folks are coming from. And so we see um, um, for many, many years now, um, word of mouth has been our largest channel for acquisition. And, you know, you were talking about uh, you've been in business seven, nearly seven years, and digital right. has evolved in that time frame. How has emails had to evolve during, during the past seven years? Right, right. And, and that's a great question because we have seen uh, a lot of evolution in our business. I would say from the meal planning standpoint, um, we've evolved with our customers. Uh, seven years ago, uh, they were all about saving money. Um, today, uh, again, going back to those, that, sur- that survey results that we had from the summer, um, the most important drivers have really shifted from saving money to now being all about a desire to save time and reduce stress. I mean, folks still want to save money uh, on their grocery spend, but what they really want to do is save time and lower their stress level, and that's more important than the money-saving factor. Um, as it relates to our overall business, um, you know, online grocery was really in its infancy seven years ago with very limited options, usually concentrated probably in more urban areas. Uh, now we see this sector maturing uh, at a fairly rapid pace, and emails has strategically evolved to continue you know, meeting the needs of our subscribers all over the country, uh, as well as you know, evolving our platform, uh, which allows us to have deeper relationships with grocers and food brands so we're really able to now deliver even more value to those businesses as well as our customers. You talk about uh, you've partnered with fulfillment retailers such as Amazon and Kroger and Walmart, Instacart, and so on. It's, it's very interesting. You see now ads that have to do with, oh, just order it on the phone and come in and pick it up. And <laughs> yeah. it doesn't quite work that way. Hey, um, <laughs> yeah. so I, I suspect there'll be a lot more evolution on that side. Do you have a yeah, perspective yeah. on that? Yeah, yeah. Look, the truth is, is that many people will always want to shop for their own groceries, right? I mean, some folks just don't want uh, someone else making uh, the decision about, you know, the perfectly ripe tomato or is my avocado ripe enough? Um, however, I do think, and I think that, that data is proving this out, that all of those companies, whether it's, you know, Walmart or Kroger or Amazon, Instacart, they're all getting better at that task, you know, be it through, you know, more efficiently and intelligently, you know, gathering those ingredients and, uh, and also expanding their footprint in more markets. So I think we're still in the early stages of the business um, and I and I have to imagine that it will only get better um, as time goes on. If you had advice to give to them, what would it be? Um, you know, just um, hiring um, and training um, folks to uh, really think about the, what the consumer is wanting um, with each of those ingredients, be it a shelf stable box of pasta or um, a head of lettuce or a, a ripe tomato. Um, I think that that it, it it's it can't just be transactional. It has to be um, on the other side of the grocery gathering piece. You're going to have to have folks that really understand what constitutes you know the the right kind of ingredient based on what that customer wants. So I think the the um, the um, relationship between the customer and the ordering piece is going to have to get more intelligent so the customer can be more descriptive in terms of what, that, what they want out of a product. And then during the gathering phase, 
um, those folks doing the gathering are going to have to be able to understand the request of those um, those customers and be able to execute that. And they're also going to have to have um, on the gathering side wider access to more products. But we'll, they'll get there. Well, this is Ann Daw, your host for Food and Wine Insider, and we've been talking with Scott Jones, the VP of Content for Emails. One. You know, we're talking about all these changes that are happening in the in the digital world, and I would love to hear your perspective on Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods and how yeah. that may be facilitating grocery shopping for the future. Yeah, yeah, it's a great one. Um, you know, I think um, you know we're just now seeing the potential synergies between a historically digital company like Amazon and a traditional grocer like Whole Foods, right? You know, there have been bumps in the road, um, and I think that was to be expected because it's, this is something that's very new. Um, but I would say, at least from my perspective, it's not hard to see that once some of these issues are worked out, uh, consumers are going to have so many more shopping options, um, be it in-store or delivered to their front door. Uh, and you can rest assured that other companies are watching this closely and are going to follow this, this, you know, the, these developments. And as you think about that, what's, what's on the horizon for emails? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, you know, we're, we're continually uh, planning for today and tomorrow. Um, I think we'll just, we'll continue to look for ways to leverage our platform with partners, uh, be it those in the grocery space or the food brand space. Um, and we will continue to listen to what our, constant, our customers are saying and work to continually improve how we're delivering our meal plans and other services and additional value through our mobile app and whatever new channels we're able to uh, develop. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about who is involved in the business. You're heading up content. What are the other roles that are in the management of, of emails? Sure, sure. We have um, a CEO, um, as you would imagine, a CFO. We have a, um, a CTO and his team of, of developers and data scientists who are continually developing improvements for our mobile app and, and um, how we're able to analyze um, user um, interfacing and satisfaction with their experience. Um, we have a, a head of growth marketing that's um, working with his team to, you know, continually optimize and explore new ways to um, get the emails message out and amplify that. And um, we have someone who oversees our customer success team. Um, again, that's a, a, a bank of, of team members who are there just about around the clock interacting with, um, with our users, um, both online and on the phone to help um, make sure they're having the best experience. And then you have uh, myself who oversees the, the actual uh, the content piece of the company. And how do you all work together? Do you come together as a team? Do you <laughs> process yeah, this we kind do. of we're, an we're, interesting we're, thing in organizational development? So It is, it is. And, um, you know, we spend a lot of time um, – um, in, um, you know, we're, we're real big on, on the whole team concept and, um, you know, the, the sharing of, of ideas and uh, making sure that uh, because um, we're always looking for the best ways to improve our product and the customer's experience with our product, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of um, uh, cross-sharing in terms of how, how each one of us can improve that and, and the feedback that we're getting through our various um, channels, whether it's our marketing or content or customer success or, you know, the, what we're hearing on the, on the um, uh, app and data side. Um, and um, so we spend a lot of time together. We have um, our main headquarters is in Birmingham, Alabama. We have um, an office in Atlanta. So we're meeting uh, many times we're spending a lot of time on um, uh, video conference calls, uh, sharing um, ideas and planning. But um, you know, it's 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 like any um, any company you know that's that you know kind of thinks of itself as a as a kind of high growth tech company. 
we're, uh, we're leaning on technology to help us be more efficient in the way that we're communicating with each other and hopefully uh, even, you know, turning to deliver that value back to the customers. You know, one of the critical things, especially in the Internet business and things moving so fast, is to remain relevant and really resonate with the consumer because someone could come in and sort of say, okay, uh, I'm going to one-up emails and co- and do it yeah. at this level. And right. um, it's not difficult to get – well, it's not – impossible but it's to be in the internet business someone could come in and sort of change the rules and being constantly aware of that and evolving yourself has to be pretty a pretty critical thing that you all talk about how do you how do you think about that well look uh, I, the fact is is that you know again it, i'm of the opinion that if you spend all of your time worrying about that uh, you, you'll never find the time to uh, build out the company in a way that makes it stay relevant. So um, our CEO, Forrest Collier, and our um, CTO, Aaron Kinney, are both uh, very, very plugged in to the, uh, to the industry and are always, you know, making sure that they're listening to where, you know, our strategic blind spots may be. And, um, and so we, we keep, we, you know, we're, we're always aware of that. But the fact is, is that, we, um, we are always looking for ways to build um, or to build, continue to build out um, what emails does both as a business and as the platform we created and always looking to strategically partner with those companies who we can help, you know, improve the business that they're doing, whether it's a traditional grocer or it's a food brand that wants to amplify what they're doing in a new way, um, like through our platform and making sure that we're um, having these kinds of partnerships that not only keeps us relevant, but keeps us growing as the whole world of online grocery grows. So, you know, we'll keep doing that. We'll always be aware of that, you know, someone may uh, enter the marketplace tomorrow that might um, do something bigger and better than what we're doing. So uh, that's part of the competitive nature of being in business. You've just got to, you've got to stay agile and smart and, uh, not move too fast and be strategic and make sure you've got, you know, the right, the right people in the right seats on your kind of company bus. No, I think that's a really extraordinarily good point because if you're not continuing to evolve, if you're not look and you have that sort of direct link to the consumer, you know what they want, you know what's happening in their lives and you can continue to address their needs. Uh, that's certainly a fabulous way of staying out ahead of ahead of the competition. I always find it tends to be a lot of little things that people yes. do or companies do than than necessarily the big thing that people can see, and that re- helps you to remain uh, relevant and uh, resonates with the with the consumer. Scott, tell us your website for we people, where people can find emails. Sure, sure. Um, it's um, emails. E-M-E-A-L-S dot com. Um, emails dot com. Easy to get there. Um, we offer a free two week um, trial of our product. So, you know, anyone can, can go and test drive emails um, at no obligation, uh, but it's emails dot com. Well, this interview will be on food and wine insider dot com tonight. And you can listen to this and all previous shows and those that are upcoming. There's a survey you can also fill out to give us some advice on what guests you would like to hear from. Scott Jones, VP of Content, thank you so much for being on the show. I think the emails platform is fascinating and certainly solves a very big problem for consumers when they think about what's for dinner, and I'm sure they think about that, for what's for <laughs> breakfast and lunch too, but um, I think that um, it's, it's really a helpful platform to, to get people the kind of food they need so they're not uh, they're eating the right kind of food. I think you have a, you know, the health version. You have ones that have to do with diabetes. You have you know, making sure people are eating properly but also enjoying the food they're eating. That's right. That's right. And um, it's been my pleasure being on the show, Anne. Uh, Thanks so much. Thank you. 
You've been listening to Food and Wine Insider with Ann Daw and Don Mazella. Want to join us on a future show? Contact us at foodandwineinsider.com. Until next time, have a passion for food, wine, and profits. And think of our program, Food and Wine Insider.